What's up everybody? Sean here with another live lift roll video and I'm here with my friend Tom who we are going to do a live discussion on, on uh, uh, catheters, catheters today. today. I'm going to kind, kind of go, go over some, some of the options, options with catheters. catheters. I'm, I'm going to cover, I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna I'm gonna cover some, some options like super cubic because, because that's, that's what I have and I've used, used for years. years. Um, Tom does, does intermittent cathing and he has a couple different uh, things, things he can, he can share with about that, that as well as, well as bladder, bladder augmentation, augmentation um, and, and a few other, other things. things. So we're going to get, get into all those different topics. topics. Um, first, we're going to start with a quick intro. You guys, you guys know me, but real quick, I'll just say my name is Sean. Um, I'm a C5, C6 quadriplegic uh, from a snowboarding accident 16 years ago. You guys know me from the channel, trying to help everybody out if I can. And yeah, just do what I can. So here's my friend Tom. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Tom, uh, in case you missed the intro last time, or the time old, I've been a quadriplegic for 23 years, I'm a C5, C6 quad, just like Sean, I was in an automobile accident when I was 4 years old, so I've been paralyzed for most of my life, living the quad life, and uh, yeah, I'm very excited to talk, talk about catheters. Alright, uh, sweet dude, uh, um, so, so, um... I guess, I guess. So, so we're, we're going to start, start basically, basically um, Tom, do you want to real quickly uh, mention, so, so I'm going to talk about, about super cubic catheters, give you guys some of the pros, cons, cons maintenance, uh, some, some of the variations, variations different, different things you can use, um, go over other like Foley catheters and the difference between super cubic and Foley, and then Tom is going to go over intermittent, and then you want to just explain, just give a brief like, like, you know, intro, intro of, like, intermittent, intermittent and then, uh, the, the, I always, always forget what that is called, called surgery. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> go for uh, it. And I'll talk through my whole thing, man. Uh, so, what I, I mean, for, like, the first, like, 14 years of my injury, I just did intermittent cathing um, through my urethra. I, I don't know, I have never been a fan of the indwelling catheters. I'm not sure why. Like I think the right doctors early on scared me, you know, like from like warning me from infections or something. Which I've still, you know, battled and fought with my entire life, even doing intermittent cathing. But uh, when I was fifteen years old I was suffering like infections constantly. I must have had like two years of almost non stop infections. And I couldn't really figure out why, but it turned out because I was injured so young, and this can happen to you know someone who's injured as an adult too, um, I got this thing. It's called a neurogenic bladder. My bladder was just too small for my body. Like it wasn't growing to the size that it needed to, and I wasn't able to hold a uh, regular volume for you know a teenager. I was drinking too much, and it was just stressing out my bladder all the time. So I got a bladder augmentation. They took some small intestine uh, tissue, and they just extended my bladder and made it bigger, uh, which solved my issue with, you know, not being able to hold enough and, you know, like the constant infections. But what they also did was uh, they gave me, it's called a Metrophanoff procedure, um, which is basically like they created a port, like in my abdomen. It's called a catheterizable stoma that I catheterized through. It's almost like a second urethra that they built from, like, different tissue. Um, and the reason that they... I got that, and they did that surgery uh, because I could still technically catheter my urethra. Was independence, um, being limited with my quad hands, being able to, you know, catheterize to my urethra was difficult. It's not that I couldn't do it; it's just that I couldn't easily do it on the go or even at home. It was a very difficult thing for me to do independently. So I opted for the um, augmentation surgery, uh, the metrophanol procedure when they did the augmentation surgery, which allowed me to basically just catheterize more easily. So I do intermittent catheterization every three to five hours through my stoma and my abdomen. And um, I don't know, like I've had it for going on more than 10 years now, and it was a game changer for me. It really opened the door to being able to go out, you know, like keep a couple of cats in my bag, not have to worry about assistance or help. You know, just pop into any bathroom anywhere, you know, like self-cath on my own. And it really 
was like the starting point to like me being more independent and starting to like live my life more independently was kind of unlocking that door. And I know it is like a big thing for, you know, most people recovering or following their injury is learning how to catheterize independently or being able to avoid independently through superpubic or some other means. Um, and, you know, that freedom that that gives you, not having to worry about, you know, having an accident, you know, peeing your pants or something. Um, it really was like a big life changer for me. Right. right yeah, yeah, yeah that's independence, independence was a huge thing, thing and basically, basically anything, anything that's going to help us become, become a little more independent is for, is for sure helpful. helpful. So that's, so that's awesome, awesome, man. man. Um, so, so as so someone who doesn't do the intermittent thing with the super pubic, what's your experience with it? Is, have you always had it? Like, so what do you like about it? So, so for me, yeah, I opted to go the super pubic route when I was first hurt. Um, and that's, and that's kind, kind of because, because of, you know, my mentor, mentor and our friend Bobby, Bobby who's been on here for the test with us. Bobby was like the, the first quad I met, and, you know, he had the super pubic. pubic. He, told he told me about, about it. it. And, and to me, it just seemed like, like a good option for me. With having no hand function, I wasn't sure what all I'd be able to do. I really wanted to be independent. You know, you were really young when you got hurt, so you, like, like independence, you worked into that, you know, I guess, you know, because, like, as a so for, so for me, me I, was, I, was, I had just, I had just turned, turned 21. 21. I had just started going to bars, bars with my friends. friends. I, had, like, I didn't really lose a lot of that independence in my life, and I didn't, life, and I didn't want to have to have somebody around all the time that could go to the bathroom with me, help me cast. I now know that I probably could have used a couple of tools and things, maybe could have figured out casting and done it intermittently like you do it. Um, but, at but at the time, time it seemed like, like a really, really good option. option. And actually, I, I, don't, I don't have, don't have any regrets. regrets. Uh, um, my first, first few months, months I, felt I felt really, really weird about having a catheter coming, coming out of me. That's, that's like one of the cons of it. You know, you constantly have this tube coming out of your body um, and a bag attached to you. So that's a definite con. But for me, after a couple months of seeing it, I just got used to it. It kind of became a natural, normal thing to me. It didn't seem weird to me at all anymore. Um, um, and, and it opened, it opened, it opened really up opened up my independence because, because like, like you said, said I didn't have to rely on somebody. If I, I can go out, out I could be, be, you know, peeing into, into a bag, bag. And, <laughs> and the bag, bag was easy enough for me to go and empty. And, like, and even if I needed help empty in the very beginning, that was a lot less invasive. I could have a friend flip the flap, like, you know, flip open the bag rather than sticking the catheter down my penis, like in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah, like, like so, exactly. So, so, <laughs> it's a whole different kind of ask. Exactly. Uh, exactly. It's a way it's different ask. ask. So, like, so, like that's like so, so different. Um, so, for, so for, me, for me, that was a big thing. That was like, like independence was a huge factor for, for making my decision, decision on getting, getting a super pubic. It just, it just seemed like for me, that was going to be an option that I could be out doing things, not worry about it. Um, and, and, you know, like you know like Bobby, Bobby even told me he could change, change his on his own, he could go home, home he could change the leg bag. Like he basically told me he could do everything on his own. And so when I heard that, 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 that kind of sold me. I was just like, okay, okay yeah, 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 you know, I, I want to do that. that. Like, because uh, um, at, at the time, time I was what is that like? So what what is it like when the super pubic? I mean, like, I just get rid of, you know, my self cath kit every time, like, I cath and, you know, just get rid of it, right? But with something more indwelling, how often do you have to change it? What? kind of like care you know goes involved with like taking care of the thing so, so um so the super so pubic, pubic, i change mine every three weeks, weeks. Uh, um i started, I started doing, do, doing it once a month uh, uh, and then i went every three, three a few years, years ago because so one, so one of the things, things with the super pubic, pubic it's constantly in your bladder and it's you know invasive something in your bladder and, and your, body your body doesn't really, really like it. And it, it kind of tends to react by creating sediment, some kind of spasms. Um, like, um, like I know you guys, guys um, sometimes with the bladder agitation, you have mucus issues with uh, stuff, stuff in the bladder. bladder. So, so I, I have, it's, it's not, not quite mucus, it's like, like more, more almost like, like a salty substance. It's like hard, crusty, like form. So it'll harden and like into like rock little pellets. Yeah, it's kind of like the same thing that like or his bladder stones inside the bladder, I think. So you want to push the line. I used to get a lot more bladder stones before I started flushing my catheter. So that's, so that's another thing I have to do to make for maintenance. So, so, so I change it every three weeks, weeks and I also flush it every other day. day. Um, I flush with a acidic solution and a saline 50 50 mix. And I basically just use a plunger, which I actually have. um uh, some pictures. Some pictures. I'll show you guys some stuff in a second, but so I use a plunger and I, 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 I stick the fluid through the catheter and it breaks up anything on the inside, kind of breaks away bacteria and helps flush it back out. 
and it, and it keeps, keeps that blockage, blockage from building up in there. In there. Um, so, by so by doing, doing that every other day, every few weeks, few weeks. I, don't I don't have too much issue with infection. With infection. Um, I mean, I, mean, I, constantly, I constantly have a little bit of an infection, but I think that's sort of normal for anybody using any type of Anybody that has anything that's like indwelling in and out, even intermittent catheters, you're constantly reintroducing outside yeah. bacteria and it's just kind of comes to the territory man right, right. So it's, it's just, just, I mean there's nothing, nothing you can, you can do, do about, about it really, really. Uh, um, so, so I mean yeah. there are things you can do about it it's just like what you said find what works flush regularly you know um, drink plenty of water um, you know like take care of your take care of yourself take care of your uh, you know catheters make sure you know you're clean wash your hands you know Take whatever steps you need to. Um, I think you know it is important to remember that kind of stuff, because I I definitely know some people uh, take it a little bit for granted, you know, just like like whatever. Like I got an infection anyways, you know. Um, the thing about it is like I don't know. I can always tell, like, I my when I first got my surgery, like I had an amazing doctor, this guy Doctor Baskin, and like did my augmentation surgery and stuff. And, like, I was, you know, dealing, like, with an infection just, like, a month after I got the surgery. I was like, what What can I do, man? Like, what What can I do? He's like, the best thing you can do is drink like a fish. He's like, drink and drink and drink. It's like, drink until you're sick. It's like, drink until you got a cat every half an hour and just flush that bladder. And he's like, I mean, anytime I get any kind of, like, small infection, you know, like, starting up that I, like, I start to get worried about, that's what I do. It's like take the day off and just drink 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 as much water as I can physically drink and yeah, just flush my bladder as much as I can yeah, yeah, yeah pretty, pretty much try to do the same thing, thing. And, so, and so that's, that's another thing with having a super pubic, pubic. I, know, I know I constantly, I constantly have, have um, so, there, so there's, there's what's called, called you guys, uh, uh, like tapping, tapping you have PVR or whatever post void residual, residual so you can, so you can like, leave, leave a little bit of urine in, in, the, in the bladder and with and the, the super pubic there's, there's always a little residual, residual. You, know, you know it's never fully fully draining, draining. so with so me, me I, I always am trying to drink a decent amount of water to keep any residual like constantly flushing out of there at least keep it fresh fluid you know um and then, and then when I feel you see like, like you were saying, you can feel it, you get like spasms, spasms you get your urine starts to smell or whatever, I do, I do the same, same thing. thing. All, all, all day, day, I would just drink, drink water, like, like bottles, bottles and bottles and bottles of water, of water just to, just to try to flush whatever, whatever I can out. out. And, and I also increase the cranberry and my demonos. I don't know if you do demonos or not. I've done demonos before. You know, honestly, I cannot say that, like, I found it made any difference for me. But I do know some people swear by it. Um, so, you know, like I, and I know that like there have been studies that shown that there's some beneficial effect of, you know, like changing the, you know, environment that won't allow the bacteria to survive in your bladder like it does. Um, so like I'm a proponent of it, but, you know, I got to be honest, like I, I didn't get much positive result out of it, but that was just my experience. I mean, I mean that's, that's everybody, you know, some stuff, some things for people, people and some don't, don't, you know, you know not, for not for others. others. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, I can't really say that I use it consistently enough to, like, you know, really? verifiably say that, you know, like, I did it right, you know, I did it, um, yeah. you know, help me. But, you know, the thing that I do uh, that I did want to mention is I've got to flush my bladder every day, too, um, in the morning. Uh, because I have the bladder augmentation, they use tissue from my small intestine to, like, extend and make my bladder bigger. But the type of cells that make up your... Um, intestine tissue are these things that are called goblet cells, and goblet cells produce mucus. Um, now, if I I can skip a day, so every morning, like kind of my routine is I do a catheterization using a straight catheter through my stoma, like in my abdomen. It's just like one of these right here. Uh, it's a, just a regular straight cath kit, um, and I have a 60 cc syringe and just irrigate it like twice. The 260cc syringes. I don't use saline solution. Sounds kind of weird, but I just use regular like tap water. Um, I have never had any issue. I mean, I, the last time I had an infection was like almost three years ago. So I've been taking care of my bladder really well. Um, but I've, I've like been doing that for a long time. I've never had any issue, you know, using regular water. Just make sure it's room temperature. 
Uh, like not too hot or too cold or anything. And um, yeah, I just flush my bladder every morning um, when I cath in the morning. And then throughout the day, uh, like I said, every three to five hours, depends. If I have a cup of coffee, like it's usually an hour before I have to cath or, you know, a Gatorade or something. But if I'm just drinking water, if I'm just doing my regular thing, it's usually every three to five hours. Um, it's different for everybody. I can tell when my bladder's full, so it's easy for me to know when I have to go cath. Not every quadriplegic has that sensation or, you know, like has that sign or signal. In that case, you need to be on a more strict schedule just because, like, you don't want to, you know, you don't, and if you're intermittent capping, you don't want to risk it. I mean, at least I didn't like to risk it, you know, either having an accident or just like stressing about bladder, leaving it in too long and like risking an infection. Um, but so I can, you know, wait a little longer just because I know, like, I get that signal, like, hey, I got to pee, like, my bladder's full. Um, and I don't have to worry about it as much, but I still try to stick to that three to five hour rule because beyond that, bacteria, unhealthy bacteria will start to grow. And that's just a rule of thumb, you know? Yeah. I don't have too much of an issue with the uh, post void re like residu residual. Like, I have done urodynamics at the doctors where they test, you know, like make sure how much your bladder empties. Yeah. I am actually like pretty like well like i'm able to empty my bladder pretty well which i feel like very lucky and grateful for um you know that like helps limit um you know the infections and things like that but that is probably the number one cause of bladder infections is not emptying completely because oh, when yeah. that urine is in there for an extended period of time um you know it's just bound to bound to cause an infection um but before i jump back to sean this is the self-cath kit that I use like intermittently throughout the day. And he's gonna pull up some pictures of the computer. I just wanted to show you know, yeah, so, like, right you know, now super like self-contained, pre-lubricated. Go ahead. I was gonna say I, I threw a one with a, a bagged one like you have. I have a little picture up on yeah. on the screen. And then you know lots of different ones. The company that I use is Coloplast. I'm not like advertising for them, um, but they've like always been my brand and you know they've been like pretty good. Um, you know, for everything that I've used, like I use the straight cath and the self cath uh, brand. These ones, it just like you empty right into the bag, um, empty the bag in the toilet or whatever, and you just get rid of it. You know, it's like one use, one and done. Just toss it, and um, I know it's great. Ever since you know, like I got my augmentation and you know started doing the you know intermittent self cathing or whatever, like. Um, Changed my life, changed my life to such a significant degree, you know, really made like moving out and independence and, you know, managing my stuff throughout the day, like possible. Nice, man. So you use the bag catheters, right? Where you actually pee into a bag, you empty it and then you throw the bag away. So like, I, yeah. I was going to explain that. So there's that option and there's also these straight cath options, which I threw a little picture on. It's basically just a tube. I think it's what they used to use more back in the day. And the, that is basically the same thing, but you have to empty it into a toilet. So people would get like an extension tube to run it into the toilet. But there's a lot more uh, chance of infection and bacteria using those. The way Tom uses it with the bag, the tube stays fully sterile in the bag until it comes out and goes inside of you. You know, so like basically it's a lot more sterile process with the, the newer bag setups. But, um, and they have a whole bunch of different ones like that. I hear people talking about hydrophilic and all the different new ones and whatever different options. So there's a ton of options out there to look so for. So that's like a kind of a big topic though, L like lubricant for your catheters, right? There's a regular like KY, you know, um, like surge of lube, like lubricant, which is like what I use. It comes like standard on all my catheters. And then there's hydrophilic catheters, which is a special kind of plastic that when you, like, you know, interact with water, it makes it super slippy. Yeah. Um, I've used both. Uh, I have a couple hydrophilic self cath kits, which like I was running low and had to use before um, and stuff. I found that the hydrophilic is too slippy for me. Like I need a little bit of tack in order to like manipulate the cath like with my quad hands. Um, like it's still smooth, you know, like sliding in with the regular lubricant, but it provides me like enough of a grip that it makes it easier for me to cath and like you know manipulate the cath how I need to whereas like I found with the hydrophilic they're so slippery they're like I found like it hard and difficult to like 
you know, manipulate and use the cath and, you know, like get the catheter inside and stuff easily. And I'm sure that that would probably go away with practice. Um, you know, I just don't use them regularly enough. Right. But in any event, kind of like what I found, um, and like it, which is why I still use the, um, you know, regular kind of lube. But I know that people with more sensation, especially in their urethra and their penis, when they like catheterize, you know, that way intermittently, hydrophilic is generally the better bet because it is a lot smoother and like a lot easier. Yeah. And I can imagine like when sensation, you know, is an issue in catheterizing intermittently, like you definitely want to consider that. <laughs> yeah yeah if you can feel it going through there you probably need the smoothest the better but um i was actually gonna exactly. one of the things i wanted to bring up is i actually have a friend that i play rugby with up north and uh he's been a quad for 20 like eight years something like that and um up until i think about five years ago he was an he, intermittent cath you know he had he had okay hand function not great he has a little bit intermittent cath yeah. but he used all his older regular catheters through his urethra and he actually tore his urethra up so bad through the years you know all those you know almost 20 years or whatever of of straight cathing with not great catheters especially back you know 28 years ago when he first started um he had to switch to a super pubic five years ago or he didn't i guess he might have been able to go to what you did um but maybe not not sure why he opted to go super pubic instead of that um but i just know that that was an issue with you know like not as smooth catheters back years that ago. is like one of the most common things that like strictures so, or you know like tearing your urethra like doing you know regular daily intermittent catheter and that's right. just wear and tear you know your tissue is in used to for an object you know like entering Going your body in and that out, consistently in and out. regularly Right. And that was like an issue I was running into even in my adolescence. Now, one of the crazy things that happened to me when I was a teenager is uh, I, I like went through puberty like at I as a paralyzed you know person, right? So I you know was injured when I was four, went through my adolescence, and then like went through puberty as a quad. Um, what happened was my like prostate started to grow like enlarge. You know, it happens when you like reach puberty, and I was running into an issue where like I could not get the catheter inside for a year and a half i gotta figure out what was going on that was like one of the things that was causing so many infections during that period and i was going to oakland children's hospital and seeing a pediatric doctor which she had not like treated an adult you know with, with spinal cord injury she was just specialized in kids well it turns out that when your prostate grows um like go through puberty or whatever yeah. you need to switch sometimes to a different type of catheter with like a curved tip called a coup de tip catheter and yeah. it allows it to like go around you know the prostate or whatever or like whatever like was causing like the inflammation or like running into it like i just had to get this curved tip catheter but you know just took talking to you know like a regular physiatrist you like treated you know adult quadriplegics um and i was like oh my gosh like that's who who knew but yeah. if anybody's out there, you know, going through puberty or adolescence or is like a parent of someone who's struggling, you know, catheterizing, you know, after like, you can't figure out why, coude tip catheters, curved tip yeah. catheters, they're like a specialized variety, which is super common for, you know, like adults, adult men who catheterize to their um, urethra. Right. Yeah, that's good to know, man. The coude tip. I've seen those before because looking up stuff and they actually even yeah. make a similar thing for super pubic or for indwelling they make ones that like mine has a balloon um actually i'll even put one on the screen real quick so um mine ha has a balloon that you inflate and holds inside the bladder um but uh the tip comes out straight and it's about like two inches it sticks off the back of the balloon and they make ones with curved tips, like a coup day tip, I guess it would be. And I was just yeah. looking into those because um, that's my issue with, with my issue right now with the super pubic. It's uh, my bladder has shrunk so small now from all these years of not filling, you know, like it's just been an, it's just been a constantly draining for 16 years. So my bladder is tiny. It's like a racquetball or maybe. Um, so if that tip isn't directly in, if it isn't placed directly in my bladder right i have crazy ad and irritation and just like um like i don't know so that, i was looking into stuff like that like maybe even just for comfort if that would help me but i yeah i don't know but but that's awesome so let's me. talk about that a little bit because that's a huge part of like 
bladder health and catheterizing for me is like dysreflexia and blood pressure. I mean, right. that probably is my biggest trigger for dysreflexia is an overfull bladder. Like I've had, I've been dysreflexic too many times to count because my bladder was overfull and like I just needed to like pee, you know, but like waited too long or whatever, right? Um, and it is like something to be really conscious of um, yeah. and, you know, like pay attention to your body and the signals that it gives. I don't know, at least for me, like my bladder is probably like the biggest cause of dysreflexia that I end up getting, you know, like and, throughout my life. Oh, 100% it is. I think for most of us, their bladder is like the initial cause. If it's not your bladder, check your bowels <laughs> and see if you got to go. Yeah. <laughs> Something might want to come out either somewhere. So you just got to, <laughs> you just got to know uh, your body for sure. But yeah, AD, man, that's what, as soon as I start getting like, cause I'll occasionally, you know, usually I'm pretty good about emptying my leg bag. If it starts getting fairly full, I empty it. But you know, there's times where I'm out doing stuff, I'm doing whatever and I let it get full, full. And like, I can tell when it gets full, full, like it's, almost hard you, like I hit it and it's hard and I start to get the, I start to get the AD like I just like the light like yeah. just a light onset on it but that's probably the same feeling that most people get when they have a starting to fill their bladder like for you guys for intermittent catheters and like that's probably one of the signs that most people use for knowing they have to go um yeah you know that's yeah it's like sure. early it's onset like, ad right you know yeah, you get that early sign like, like okay, oh, okay, okay. Like, time to go now i better go boy yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so yeah before exactly. it turns into something more and you start to get a headache and sweats and all that like but yeah when you get that initial like feeling like which after time you know you start to start to realize what those little feelings are like that first trigger um and like that's what because that's why i talk to a lot of people that's how they know they pee you have to pee is just that quit that that first ad signal and it's just like oh okay <laughs> yeah i mean i'm pretty sure like whatever my body signal is like it is like probably the first little symptom of like dysreflexia which you know like doesn't mean i'm gonna have like you know extreme onset ad in like the next five minutes like i have a little bit of time usually to you know like chill or like figure out how to get to a bathroom and stuff but uh you know it's like it's interesting i remember when i was a kid and I don't know if it's necessarily easier for an adult either. I mean, everybody's got to pee, right? Like, everybody has to use a bathroom. Like, it's just a fact of life. If you drink water, like, you're going to have to, you know, avoid eventually, or, you know, at some point. Um, but for a long time, like, I was, like, I don't know, I was scared to, like, address that part of my, like, life and myself. Like, figure out how to self cath Like, I had, you know, like, my parents or, you know, a caregiver or a nurse, um, you know, assist me catheterizing like the first decade like following my injury and I was you know young I was a kid so it's a little slightly different scenario but I really 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 like regret and wish that like I would have like owned that like part you know like started exploring that route of independence like sooner and earlier than I did because as soon as I got used to doing it on my own and as soon as I got used to like the routine and managing it just like figuring it out myself and like kind of stopping like weird and like scared about like the tubes and all of it like everything just became so much easier it became easier to stay healthy it's like maintain my own health to maintain my own comfort and you know just to like manage everything um so for those out there listening if you know you're just starting this journey um it is scary and it is hard but um don't let that stop you don't let that intimidation or that fear slow it down. Um, you know, so much of this stuff is scary and hard to deal with. But uh, believe you me that once you get over that hump and you find something that works for you and is easy to manage and take care of, like, your life will change in the positive, you know, by such a margin that, you know, it's, like, even hard to describe. Uh, it's, like, really, really night and day, you know, learning to manage things like bladder care. No, learning to manage your own care and your own health is like a huge, huge thing. Just mentally, like, just, it's just, it's so beneficial in life for, for us, especially, especially for quads. I mean, any, once you get an injury, a lot of times you just feel like life is over and you're not going to do anything for yourself. Even pairs that have full arm hand function and stuff feel like they're, you know, done. Like sometimes those first couple months and stuff are really hard and you just got to learn to figure it out and, you know it's going to be hard at first but 
if you can take as much of your own care into your into your own like hands the better you know like learn to cath yourself learn everything you need to learn about your medication and your body like just really like if you can't even keep a journal of like little triggers like if you're trying to figure out the peeing thing like if you pee yourself a long Mark time down. I had my little notebook that like my mom would help me keep with like my volume and the time that I cast and everything right, and exactly. eventually volume, you get to the point yeah. where you don't need it anymore because you're just so like you know your routine you know your body so well and stuff but it can be so helpful in managing infections or you know like figuring out what's causing infections or figuring out what's just causing regular discomfort throughout your day um yeah, yeah, sure. man. Oh, that's awesome man that's great info dude for sure <laughs> Uh, I'm glad that you said that because, like, I used to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, that's like you got to kind of in the beginning. Like, you got to try to, like, learn the patterns of what you're going yep. through. You know, like, <laughs> if you don't figure it out, you're going to be screwed. You're just going to be trying, you're like, always going to be pissing yourself for just figure, like, you know, like, why do I have UTI again? Like, it's just like, you you'll start to start to learn, you know. Um, got to figure out why and yeah it's not always easy to just know uh, without like detailing you know your routine and like understanding those patterns that maybe you aren't picking up on um, but let's do a quick overview of different types of catheters and different options for these different gonna, levels of also, injury real, real quick to one last little thing to throw in the only other uh, option I have experience with is condom cast which I, like the first six months or so of my injury I tried to use they tried to have me use and which for people that don't know a condom cath is um essentially uh i'll put a couple pictures up um it, it sounds it's exactly what it sounds like it's uh it's a condom sheath that goes over your penis that you pee into um and uh it pees into a bag it drains into a bag uh yeah it connects to a tube a catheter tube and just goes into a bag and it's very similar to a super pubic without being indwelling so it's something that you know there constantly and you drain into throughout the day but you're but relying just, i do but the only thing is you're relying on your bladder to spasm and empty your your, your urine for you so if your bladder yeah. has a strong spasm and can fully empty it's a decent option you know like if you which my bladder is very spastic and does want to fire all the time if i'm not on ditropan like i'm peeing all the time like it's my bladder wants to just leak like so it kind of worked for me. My issue was keeping them on. I just could not keep them on throughout the day. I'd always end up with it slipping, little leakage coming out. Um, and I know there's other options. People f have told me over the years, you know, they have some like, but I just wasn't sure if I wanted to be like brushing adhesive glue onto my penis and wrapping it, you know, like I, I, that's, but that is another option. So that's just, I just wanted to throw that and out And it works better for some people. I and know some paraplegics, for... and it's more commonly paraplegics that this works for because they have that stronger spasm or, you know, some level or of, some you know, like, push girl, a little bit, but, you, know, you, know, you can, like, if you get a bladder spasm, I know, like, even uh, Luis was telling me, you know, he also pushes pressure like he can he gets the spasm can internally push and then pushes on the outside as well to get a full void so if people have stuff like that you know and you can get that full void then awesome you know like that is probably a better option you don't have anything indwelling you're not sticking something in and out of your body it's you know it's a lot more sterile and and, and good for i even tried cotton cats for um i i think it was only like a couple months um like at one point when i was still doing like intermittent cathing through my urethra and I, same thing, either it wouldn't adhere enough that it would like leak or have an issue, um, like with it falling off, but, or the adherence would like be too much and it would like cause skin irritation and stuff like that. And in either case, it wasn't good for me, <laughs> you know, uh, no, but I, I like don't. you said, everyone that finds you know, what works best for them. And I know some people that like swear by the condom cath because right. it works exactly. for them. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I just wanted to mention that. And that is another option that's out there and, uh, you know, that available to people and stuff. So that's just, yeah, just wanted to make sure that was out there too. You know, we both have limited information on it and there's not a lot of extra to tell, you know, it's pretty basic. And the, the hardest thing about those is finding the right one that'll work for you that, you know, and, making sure your bladder can void so you're not getting left with a bunch of residual urine so, so, right, anyway, so that's well, my... <laughs> little overview 
just to cool. um, yeah. like go over like everything that we said in scope for quadriplegics and bear in mind Sean and I are not medical experts this is just our opinions you know like being pro quads for it, a while quad experience. Um, <laughs> super pubic um, and the Mitrofenov you know like catheterizable stoma option um, I think it's probably the top options for quadriplegics in terms of like independence you know and health like bladder health and maintenance um, like the easiest way to do it is to you know like those are the two routes they're both surgery they're both you know like kind of heavy and hard at the beginning but once you're over that hump the maintenance and maintaining it and, you know keeping your bladder healthy and like you know having it be simple and easy throughout your daily life um, those I think are probably the two your best bets at least I've found in my experience and in talking to other quadriplegics who do the same things um, for paras um, and, but bear in mind this is my opinion too if you can manage intermittent cathing and it's not too much of a burden for you and you can do it easy and you know clean and you know without having any problems quad para don't matter I think that is the best option if that is difficult for you and it's not really an option, which it wasn't for me, I think super pubic and, you know, like bladder, you know, like the catheterizable stoma and stuff is, is an okay route to take. Um, don't, don't be like, you know, don't feel weird or feel bad or feel different or, you know, feel less than because, you know, that is the option you got to take. I mean, it just is what it is. For paras, um, I think, the intermittent cathing and the condom cas are definitely more common uh, yeah. for paraplegics. Again, every spinal cord injury is different. Everybody's, you know, ability to avoid or, you know, control that is different. I know some parents that can just, you know, roll up to a, a toilet, you know, like get close and do their thing normal. Um, you know, it just is different. Um, even for even notable high-functioning quads that can do that, so. But they're yeah. very high-functioning. They're, like, not quads yeah. almost. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for paraplegics, the more common is like regular intermittent cathing because they have the hand function are able to, you know, adjust their clothes and, you know, do it more easily and more readily. And or the condom calves where, you know, they have a strong enough, you know, bladder muscle where they just are able to avoid and no bag and that works for them. Um, but then again, you know, like I know some paras that really struggle with the bladder health and bladder care and super pubics change their life. Um, you know, but at, like I said, every spinal cord injury is different. Even at the lower levels, sometimes, you know, the bladder stuff is the most affected part of their body. I think for sure. And I think it really comes down to what you want to get out of it. So like if you want more independence, you want more freedom. If you want less invasive things in your body, like, you know, you got to kind of pick and choose like what what you're more comfortable with, like what what you're OK with, basically. Because, I mean, to be honest, let's be honest, none of the options are great. Like, they're, you know, yeah. no, nothing's as good as Nobody standing up and peeing when you need to pee. <laughs> so, um, but, so they all have pros and cons for sure. And it's just a matter of weighing those out, you know, to, to what's going to work best for you. And, you know, making that decision, figuring it out is probably the hardest part of the, it all, you know, especially when it comes to something like surgery, you know, deciding yeah. to do like, like procedure, you know, like getting a stoma. I mean, I remember I was so scared before mine. I was thinking to myself, like, man, oh, man, am I doing the right thing? Um, yeah. Is this what I'm going to want? It's going to work for me. Um, you know, like my saving grace and my ability to like navigate through that was talking to other quads and pairs, um, you know having you know get, getting opinions from people that live and go through it you know like every day just like i was trying to you know hearing their stories and you know hearing about their experiences with what they have um that really like allowed me to navigate and figure out that and you know help like guide myself to you know what i think is really best for me and is easiest for me and you know everybody has to figure that out for themselves i was very fortunate to have some great doctors along the way too you know find a good um you know uh, doctor that knows the urinary tract of paras and quadriplegia. Having a good urologist is very history. beneficial, for sure. Um, and you want to, if you can, find a urologist who has experience with spinal cord injury. Yeah, you know, That 
like nothing against regular urologists, but they just do not have the level of understanding that's necessary for you know someone in our situation. Um, yes. So finding a urologist that does have that experience really was night and day for me, and I think a lot of people. Yeah, no, it definitely helps for sure because I. I kind of went from, I had a good urologist when I was at Northridge, but then he retired. So I kind of just went to like a sort of regular urologist um, that was local and I could found and just, I, I had some issues. So I ended up finding the people that uh, took over my old urologist practice, Dr. Klein and them over at Northridge, which you know. Yeah. Sure. Um, so yeah, I just went back to I mean, I've always, and, I've always yeah. found that like <laughs> my way to like navigate to the specialist is through my physiatrist. So a physiatrist oh, okay. is a doctor of physical medicine. They're the ones that usually specialize in spinal cord injuries. And I don't know, like my physiatrist recommended me to like all my other different kinds of doctors to help me with like my bladder stuff, you know, like my different kind of stuff. Uh, my physiatrist always knew the ones that had spinal cord injury experience. So I think that's like kind of a neat trick. If you do have a spinal cord injury, you should have a physiatrist, a spinal cord injury doctor, and they should be able to navigate you to, you know, specialists in other regards that, you know, have spinal cord injury experience. Yeah, that's good information, man. That's a, something that everybody should definitely take note and try to, yeah, try to find. Because that's why, dude, I still drive an hour and a half to my doctor that's in Northridge because I'm just afraid well, do you to find, find one, one dude? Here. You don't want to leave. <laughs> it's for yeah, real, though. It's just, yeah, you know, I know a you... guy that travels to Northern California and lives here in LA because he loves his doctor so much. You know, he just like plans a trip every like four or five months. Yeah. And I guess if you're in an emergency situation, they can usually call your doctor and things and get yeah. uh, some stuff. But man, that's, that's cool. Good stuff, dude. Um, yeah. Uh, so I was going to just take the, there's a couple uh quad life is in our chat. And uh, he, he mostly self-caths also. So he's a quad self-cathing. Um, and you mentioned quad life. I don't know if you're still in here, but you said you hate wearing diapers. Is that something that you wear when you're not cathing? Or is that you have to wear those with uh, as well as cathing? Because, um, yeah, I just was curious said, uh, at that when I saw him pop it up in the chat. Just didn't want to interrupt the, what we were going, though. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. At least for me, like... Um... And a lot of people think that's a big dignity thing, right? Um, I mean, no, nobody wants to do that. Uh, yeah. no, uh, no, like, how many adults want to, at the very least? Um, there is a way to manage it without having to. I mean, I don't know, at least I, uh, you know, go through my day to day without having to, uh, just because I found a way to manage my care without, you know, having accidents. And it's right. not, it's not easily found. It takes work and, you know, time and everything um, figuring out you know what works for you and I mean I hate to admit it but you know still pee my pants sometimes like it's just a fact of life um, you know but very rarely you know does something like that happen um, and once you are able to establish a consistent and regular routine um, you should be able to manage without um, like I know it's possible yeah, it's just hard. He he texts when he goes. He uses them when he goes out. So I think just in case of accidents. So one of the things I know uh, another friend that uses instead of using like a full diaper, he uses um, I forget what they're they're called. It's basically a man pad. It's it's like it's made. It's it's basically um, it's made for men and it's like a urinary guard. That's a guard. That's what they're called. They're called like urine guards or something like that. And it basically just goes in the front of like your pants. Just like right over, you know, like where you would pee directly into. Um, so you're not wearing an entire diaper over everything. It just like, and that's for like minor leaks. So like if you're having a full blown accident, it's not going to help you much. But if you're having like minor leaks, like, you know, on your way to cath or like during a transfer, because I know some people have issues with like, you know, light leakage. Um, that's an option for like light leakage. Instead of using a full blown diaper, you could use just a, like a guard in there to catch that little excess urine but and if you just like google like male urinary incontinence protection like there's all kinds of different stuff out there for people that's like yeah like you know pad. better options you know if like diapers and things are hard which they are for a lot of people so do your research 
uh, make sure to look around for stuff too because there may be something that you know works better for you and that you know is like easier and um, you know whatever but uh, yeah no, any yeah, other questions sure. um, yeah was there any other questions from anybody else guys um, I, was just I got a little fun that, fact for you Sean what's that you know who invented the catheter? I do not. It's going to blow your mind. Benjamin Franklin. Really? Yeah, he helped invent the first urinary um, catheter. It's because his brother-in-law was suffering like a severely debilitating UTI. He couldn't catheterize. Or, I mean, couldn't like, you urinate. Know, evacuate, urinate. Yeah. And he Made created this piece of plastic, built the first catheter. And I gave it to his brother-in-law. That is an interesting fact. That's crazy. crazy. Little crazy fun fact for anybody out there. Good old that Ben is... Franklin. That guy was ahead of the curve on a lot of things. <laughs> that is crazy, man. Um, we're from the L.A. area. Both of us are. Um, yeah, I'm little, in the San Fernando I'm Valley. south of L.A. He's a little north of L.A. Yeah, I'm on the north side, and uh, um, you're on the southeast side. Yeah, that is... <laughs> Um, but yeah, man, that's cool though. That's a pretty cool fact. The interesting, yeah, I dude, I definitely did not know. That. I, I read it on like a Wikipedia one day. I'm like, I'll never look at a hundred dollar bill the same again. <laughs> that is, that's really crazy. That's super or a cool. catheter, yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, that's pretty crazy. That's cool, man. Um, all right, so um, yeah, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions or anything. I think we covered most of the the topics we were talking about. Um, Oh, one of the other things I did want to mention too on maintenance for the super pubic, I, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, was that we mentioned the flushing, but also keeping your catheter site clean. So like I clean it morning and night and I have a gauze that I use during the day around the site uh, because it is like an open wound and little like there's a little bit of like mucusy pus stuff that can come out of it, especially if I have a UTI. Like if I notice that's getting redder or more prevalent, I know it's not good. I got to make sure that's cleaner, you know, flush it more. Try like, I know it might have a little bit of a, a UCI and I've actually had a skin infection. Like, and if not, it wasn't inside my bladder. It was actually at the site of the catheter. Um, I had an infection there where I needed like a antibiotic ointment. So that's even something to, you know, make sure you're careful of, uh, just keeping the site clean and stuff. Which I'm sure with And yours. that's your rule of thumb for almost everything, you know. Yeah, keep your everything. skin clean. Yes. Keep yourself clean. Um, you know, like I uh, haven't ever had any like major significant skin issues surrounding my um, the stoma site where I catheterized through. Had a little bit of like redness, like skin redness um, from time to time, but nothing that, you know, like lasted more than a day. Um, but that is because I am vigilant and active in taking care of myself and you know, making sure I wash my hands and keep my skin clean and, you know, like yeah. use wipes and, you know, use things to just make sure you're clean. It's not super difficult and preventative care is the best care because if you don't prevent it and you end up getting something, it's never fun. I promise you that. And it's always harder than if you would have just taken the time to, you know, clean and, you know, do more steps to prevent. Um, so that preventative care is number one, paramount, especially with catheter care <laughs> oh yeah for sure yeah now definitely keeping we everything clean and especially right now <laughs> but just for normal oh, our, that, our normal that's bacteria said, you know uh, um like i don't think you got to be a hypercondriac about like using iodine and you know stuff like wash your hands like that's not you know yeah, rapid time uh, like i wash my hands before i cath and afterwards um but like i've heard stories i mean I heard this crazy story about a guy that like kept his like intermittent cath, just like a reasonable straight cath. He kept it like wrapped up in his shoe, like he tucked it inside his sock, and he would just like use that like throughout the day and change it once a day and just rinse it out. And the guy had like the best bladder health like around, like he hadn't had an infection in almost 15 years. I mean, some people are just things are weird and things are crazy. But that being said, obvious simple things washing your hands you know making sure your catheterization site is clean you know before and after you know stuff like that i don't use iodine or anything every time i cath all my catheter kits yeah. come with it to like clean the area like i think that's kind of overkill um 
But, you know, at the same time, like, if I'm out, you know, about touching stuff on public trans, especially now with, you know, what's going on and everything, I always, always, always make sure to wash your hands and stuff. And, you know, just do the simple things to, to keep yourself clean and healthy. <laughs> good advice, man. That is good. <laughs> um, so he also asked um, how, uh, um, yeah, how the quarantine has been affecting us. As any, just I mean, <laughs> probably the same way it's affecting everybody, but <laughs> making me a little more stir crazy, a little bit more bored than I've been uh, in the yeah. last uh, few years. Um, you know, health wise, not really uh, in any negative way. Um, you know, I'm lucky. I've still got all my supplies coming. I've, you know, got my caregivers coming still. Um, you know, I haven't had any issues running into you know any interruptions in my care and stuff so I mean health wise I've been able to maintain everything just the same as before um, mental health wise and physical wise just been trying to you know keep my brain busy um, you know not just watch Netflix and play video games 24 uh, 7 but you know get outside at least once a day you know if, you know still social distancing get some sunshine I've been doing some online courses and stuff I've been you know working out my wrist weights every day for like you know 45 minutes trying to you know get a little physical activity in and yeah just you know keep improving myself in a positive way you know even if it's in the only small ways while that's we're awesome, all still man. isolated <laughs> that's the best we can do right now and that's pretty much what i've been and lots of virtual hangouts with friends which has been a saving grace <laughs> <laughs> yeah that... thank goodness for internet and computers <laughs> What's funny, I had never really done like FaceTime calls before this, but now I'm just like, yeah, FaceTime. <laughs> like you don't even think about it. It's like I'm going to FaceTime the homie instead of call. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's almost normal now. It's weird. It's kind of become more normal for everybody. But it's cool. I mean, I think we're st starting L.A. County, maybe not as much, but out here things are starting to open in San Bernardino County a little bit. Um, and uh, we'll see. I don't know how yeah. much. I'll be getting out The doing transition stuff, is but... occurring for sure. Um, you know, like, sure. I honestly appreciate the extra precaution. Um, I mean, every life is precious, and, you know, we shouldn't take any of it for granted. So, you know, like breaking some of these protocols and putting more people at risk, especially our population. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not about that. So I'm okay, you know, extending the stay-at-home orders and taking the time for things to be done right if it means that, you know, more people are protected in the long run so we can get a vaccine or something. So, you know, things are definitely going back to normal, but uh, I think people got to realize is that, you know, the new normal for now is okay. If it means, you know, in the yeah. long run, more people are going to be safe and healthy. Yeah, especially for us, like you know? quads, we have pretty limited lung function. Like I know I had pneumonia when I got hurt and it was one of the worst experiences of my life, having to get my lungs <laughs> suctioned out, them like suctioning fluid out of me multiple times a day and just, it was terrible. I don't want to do it. And uh, you know, I turned into pneumonia when I was a kid. Same thing. And uh, you know, we just don't have that respiratory capacity to move that liquid and that fluid out of our lungs like everybody else does. So you know, it's even. I mean, you guys all know. I'm sure you know all the quads out there know. You know, all the parents out there know that you know we're a little. I mean, some parents are respiratory compromised. Oh yeah, if you're uh, yeah for sure even, injury up yeah definitely. Um, even just sitting all the time you know, can affect your respiratory system True. and stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's important to, to take those steps to avoid it, you know, avoid exposure and to limit that risk. Because if it does happen, you know, shoot, might be lucky and, you know, make it through. You know, I it's pray everybody that does catch it, that is quadriplegic or paraplegic does, but we are at more risk. And it's just the, the fact of the matter. Yeah. Here, dude, um, real quick before – we wrap stuff up here too. Um, somebody asked actually, um, they're interested about how psychologically, uh, interested about the psychological way having the calf affects you. She's dating a spinal cord injury guy uh, that's reluctant to talk about it. And uh, she doesn't want to push it on him, but she, she, I don't know. So she's wondering if there's any psychological issue to having the calf, which I mean, there's a psychological issue to just being in a wheelchair and having a spinal cord injury and all the stuff that comes with it. Cathing is a big part of it. I mean, you know, like I, I'm sure cathing is a little different than super pubic, but even it, 
you know, for me, it, it, it was a little bit weird to get used to in the beginning to have having this, you know, bit bag on me and having to like do like not be able just to pee when I had to pee and like feel like all this like normal type of stuff. But um, it's not something that's like a huge hang up mentally. Like if he's not having issues with it, like if he seems fine, then he probably is. I yeah. Guess. I mean, generally in my experience, you know, um, if you guys haven't been intimate yet, you know, that's usually the um, hardest part is like that first time, you know, you guys are like in bed together, you know, like clothes are coming off. Like that's usually where the you get a little self-conscious, you know, you get like, kind of weirded out by it but let me tell you like once you get over that first hump like once you get over that first like time or two and he sees that like it's not a big deal for you and you're just comfortable around it you know it's there but it's not something that's like constantly drawing your attention or you know you're unable to like not focus on it it's just there it's just another thing and like right. once you for those first couple of times a lot of that fear that anxiety that you know self-conscious like feeling it just goes away and right. uh, like I've got the will for him, uh, you know, just just take it all in stride. Um, you know, I I think it's a little easier for me, you know, doing the intimate stuff, not having you know something indwelling. Like I go to the bathroom, just like you know, I go to the bathroom like anybody else does, and I just take care of it. You know, it's not something that like my significant other is like you know involved with because I just go to the bathroom and handle it. Now I do have the stoma, like it does look different on my abdomen a little bit um and yeah i mean i experience the same kind of self-conscious like oh, i hope that's not too weird or anything you know especially being with someone new for the first time yeah. um it's but i am not i've yet to experience someone that like couldn't get over it or like had a problem with it that they couldn't like not forget about it or not focus on i've never been with someone who's like oh that's weird and yeah. you know that self-conscious feeling that i had that's you know i was able to get over it you know just after those like first couple times like it was just like five minutes of anxiety and then i'm like you just forget about it because there's more fun to, you know stuff to focus on you're not gonna be sitting there worried about you know like what your stoma looks like or you know what your super pubic cat looks like because you know hopefully you're gonna be focused on you know the other person you know whatever right. else is going on so just take it slow don't force the issue with him um you know like there's gonna be a point where it's going to be there and just act normal. And I mean, I'm totally assuming that you're cool with it and it's not a big deal for you. Just act normal. And yeah, I, it I'm sure like it's for her. you, I think you she's won't, worried you won't have a problem. Awesome. Yeah. You, what's your experience it. with it, bro? Well, I mean, I'm so I had, I was a little conscientious about it with my super pubic, but I like still was sort of dating somebody when I got hurt. Um, and when I got the thing, and she kind of told me like it was okay like she sort of was okay with it which at the beginning like i, I just kind of thought she was just trying to you know be nice to me and stuff but eventually once like that relationship ended and i ended up starting to date again and getting out there um the first time i was a little nervous about it um uh, but after the first time and she didn't react or seem weird about you know the catheter at all like and i even before we had gotten to that point i kind of explained like what i had like i wasn't just gonna be like you know, like I wanted to tell her something was there, you know, like I have a catheter, it's yeah, here, you know, like I told her the situation beforehand and it was all good, you know, like there was no, there was no weirdness, no issue. I haven't, I, like you said, I've never had somebody be like, oh, I'm out, nope. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and everybody, everybody's body conscious, you know, disabled yeah. or not, everybody has little, you know, we're, yeah. nobody's perfect. You know, yeah. we all have our imperfections that you know I think everybody struggles with a little bit you know like that first time they're being with someone um, but in every yeah like um, instance where I've had to face that communication is key you know like I'm not an intimate with someone that didn't like have an idea of you know like what my disability meant you know in regards to that kind of stuff and you know like just it was alright it wasn't like too hard to you know have that conversation um, you know and it really is kind of a test of whether or not the person is kind of the right person for you because if they do have a problem with it, they can't handle it, trust me, you don't want to be kicking it with that person. Same with, you know, the individual that's disabled. If they can't get over it themselves and, you know, be like, you know, they're with you and completely with you, you know, like right. that might not always be the healthiest thing. And, you know, it is something to 
to be you know considerate of um no that's you know they, that's a good point man. yeah yeah because sometimes all, we're the ones uh, with the problem you know like, able-bodied person in a relationship <laughs> no that's very true that's very true because i know other people i've talked to people have messaged me you know because i have the video about sex and masturbation and stuff like i have some of the so like i've had people contact me about intimacy things like that you know like and um like people are just nervous about their first time like with their partner and stuff and it's just like it, and i mean we're probably gonna have to like, do a whole episode on that topic bro, yeah because no, that's, that, that'll like de whole, definitely be an episode for sure but that's just a whole just another, yeah that is a whole other thing but uh it does sort of go into with the catheterization urinary stuff you know it's all the same area yeah. <laughs> Yep. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, definitely do a topic on that and stuff. But and that's a really sure. great question, though. I'm really glad that you uh, brought that up because that is a big thing for a yeah, lot of for sure. Just being comfortable with yourself—that's what Quad Life said. That's you true. know, that's exactly deciding what, what you want to do, deciding you know about a super pubic. I mean, it is a it is consideration. Yeah, all those things are things to consider. You know, if you're going to be too conscientious about it, it might not be a good option. Um, yeah, whether you're single or you have a partner, you know, like talking about that thing. See, yeah, this is so one thing. of the, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent here with the whole sex talk, but one of the things that Bobby told me and sold me on was like, hey, you're pretty much always ready to go with sex for a super pubic. You don't have to empty. You don't have to worry about cat. Like you don't have to worry about voiding yourself first or anything like that. He's like, you're good to go. He's like, like anytime, anywhere. He's like, it's, you're, it's not attached to your penis. It's, it's you know, it's so that was for me as 21. I was like, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> that sounds that sounds okay. <laughs> but um, and that was one of the things you know, that was one of the pros that Bobby told me, and I was like, yeah, you know, that makes sense. But like, that's also the, yeah, the I mean, it's it like a consideration. Fair. Like every time before I like transfer into bed, especially before <laughs> amorous activity, like uh, gotta make sure you cast. Like it's uh, just you know, my, my, it mom, is. my mom just messes that remind me she was here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Donna. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get it back to the PG topic. <laughs> uh, uh, that's awesome. All right. Well, anyways, I think we pretty much did cover most of our catheter issues and stuff, um, the options and things. Yeah, we are about that one hour mark, too. Yeah, we went like double the time we were planning. So, um, hey, that's all right. Like, the conversation was flowing and like this is good good conversation i thought we covered some good points i hope everybody else was uh uh you know enjoyed it and stuff so got some good tips out of it and my mom says hi tom <laughs> and uh, uh everybody that is tuned in oh and next anthony's tuesday in here too. Anthony. Uh, thanks anthony same time um we're gonna be doing this every week a different topic every week um if you guys have any like topics that you want to discuss anything you know specifically you want touched on uh message uh sean you know live to roll um inbox and uh you know we'll do our best to cover what we can um and yeah yes. come on back and watch us again yeah, hit that we'll subscribe leave... button don't forget to like and comment That's click right. that little bell to get those notifications <laughs> yes tom <laughs> yeah so we will be back next tuesday guys uh same time same place um and yeah i think next week we i think we're gonna do bowel care but i'm not haven't finalized it yet but i think bowel and bladder are two good broad things that we all need to you know hear about learn about so <laughs> yeah not the fun topics but you know the ones we all need to know about right yeah right <laughs> but all right man i think we'll wrap it up then for this one but uh like tom said subscribe like all that stuff comment and um, uh, if you guys want to, uh, I'll, I'll post the broadcast probably a few days before we actually post it, so you can, you know, know it's coming. But just know next Tuesday around 3 p.m. we'll be there. Thanks everybody for participating. Y'all are awesome. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Peace.